Two weeks ago, we read about some good news and some bad news. Let's turn to it. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24, 14 and 15. Matthew 24, 14 and 15. I'm so glad to see so many Bibles. Matthew 24, 14 and 15. Verse 14, this is the good news. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations and then shall the end come. And then the bad news. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place who so reads, let him understand. The bad news is that a desolator is coming in connection with the end time. In the first century, the desolator was the Roman army, 70 AD. They leveled the city of Jerusalem, uh, broke the temple down, and burned much of it. It was destroyed. Some want to rebuild that temple. But what God destroys is pretty hard to rebuild. <laughs> I think that there's going to be some movement in that direction. I think, the, I think they'll try. But another desolator is coming. He wants to put his name in the place where God's name is. In the Old Testament, there are nu numerous references that refer to the sanctuary, the ancient sanctuary that, that Moses built and then uh, Solomon built and uh, the restoration after the captivity, uh, references that say that the sanctuary or the temple was the place of God's name. That's a pretty important idea, don't you think so? The place of God's name. He wants to stand there where he, where he ought not to stand, the desolator. And you can read about that in 2 Thess Thessalonians, the second chapter. We won't turn there right now, but we will a little later. But we, when he stands in that place, it's like the final straw. Revelation 18, verse 5 talks about, about Babylon. When Babylon finally falls, it says, For her sins have reached to where? To heaven. Sins have reached to heaven. That's the last straw. It's like the stick in the fire. Like David it is time for thee, O God, to work, for they have made void thy what? Thy law. When God's law is made void, uh, it's time for God to work, and he will work. The devil will work through an earthly desolator, like the Roman army in 70 AD, who destroyed the place of God's name when he destroyed the temple where God's name was written in the ark. Anciently, the sanctuary was the place of God's name. The Ark of the Covenant contained the Holy Law. And in the middle of that law, right in the heart of the law, is God's name written. The seventh day is the Sabbath of what? What does it say? Lord, Lord thy God. Angels veil their faces when they mention that name. It's a very sacred place. A desolating usurper comes, comes who claims the authority to change God's times and laws. The place of God's name. The last message of mercy in the world, which we're privileged to give and to take to the world, right? Amen. The last message of mercy to the world will be to proclaim God's name because name represents character in the Bible, right? We even use that expression today. If somebody has a good name, right? What do we think about him? He has a good name, he has a good character. And uh, so God's name, Revelation chapter 14, verse 1. Revelation chapter 14, verse 1. That's an easy one to find. This is right in the very heart of the book of Revelation. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion. And with him were 144,000, having the Father's name written where? In their foreheads. What does that mean? The Father's character. 
He shares that with us. I can't imagine such a wonderful thing that we're looking forward to. The seventh day Sabbath is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. That is his name. Isaiah 48, 2 was in our scripture reading this morning. I am the Lord. That is my name. And I'll not share it with another. Yes, he does. He shares it with his people. Take his name out of the law. And this law is made of none effect. That's how you desolate the place of God's name. The third commandment, thou shalt not take the name, this is the third commandment now, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God, what? In vain. vain. That leads right into the fourth commandment where the name is mentioned. I, I, I just discovered that relationship just a couple of weeks ago. I was thinking about this thing, I was reading the commandment and thought, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. The next Sabbath, the next commandment is where his name is written. And uh, why would we leave that one out? It tells here who that, who that name belongs to, the creator of heaven and earth and sea. And the law points to the Savior. Galatians 3, verse 24. Let's look at that one. Galatians 3, verse 24. This gives us some idea of the importance of God's law, where his name is written, right in the heart of it. Galatians 3, verse 24. Galatians 3, verse 24. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Let's all look at this one. Wherefore the law was our, school, is, was our schoolmaster to do what? To bring us to Christ. How do we come to Christ unless we have a mirror and see that we have a need of a Savior and a Redeemer? That we might be justified by faith. You know, only justified believers are right before God. He looks at a justified believer as though he had never, ever sinned. What an idea that is. And all of us need to be but justified believers, right? Give yourself to God in the morning. Make that your first work. And uh, come into sympathy with his work. He came into sympathy with our problem, right? And he wants us to come into sympathy with his work. Our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, removing our sins not only from that temple in heaven, but the blotting out of sins of people here on the world, in the world. How else could a people be ready for Jesus to come and look up into the sky and say, lo, this is our God, we've waited for him. How else could that happen? You can't bypass his work in the sanctuary with some other idea. Justified believers allows God to write that name in his forehead. <clears throat> Let's look at a couple of texts. Revelation chapter 7, verse 3. Revelation chapter 7, verse 3. It says, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have, what does it say next? Seal the servants of God in their foreheads. What an idea that is. We've just been talking about that's the God's character written in our foreheads of all who believe, all who are justified believers, all who put themselves in the care of the Savior. Hebrews 8, verse 10. Back just to the left, just a few pages. Not very far. Hebrews 8, verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make, after, make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind, into their mind, and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. That's a new covenant. How many new covenant Christians do we have here this morning? Every, every hand should be raised, right? <laughs> I had somebody tell me a while ago, well, you know, you're not a New Covenant Christian because you keep Sabbath. <laughs> Let's look at another one. 
in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every truth be established, right? Hebrews chapter 10. Holy Spirit's involved with this. Who is the great sealer? <laughs> it's the Holy Spirit. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God by which you are sealed unto what? The day of redemption. The day of redemption is drawing nigh, by the way. How many of you have been watching the news? <laughs> my, oh, my. What's happening to our dear country? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 15. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. That's talking about the blotting out of sins, my friends. That comes as one of the last things. That comes as Christ's ministry in the sanctuary in heaven comes to a close. And the sins of God's people, all who have confessed their sins, you know, our sins should be going forward into judgment, right? And all who are under the blood will have their sins blotted out and put on the head of a scapegoat. No more to be remembered or come into mind. What a wonderful Savior. What a plan. The sanctuary is a complete plan. A, 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 a teacher for us to know how he saves us. And uh, what a privilege to know some of these things. This is the staging ground for the whole plan of salvation. This is bought, battle is fought out every day in the hearts of believers. And the focal point of that conflict is the battle for my mind and your mind. That's where the law is supposed to be written, right? It's a battle for that. No one can possibly take the law seriously who is not justified believer or a forgiven believer. No one can take the law seriously unless you really believe that. Justification is a word from the law courts. Being set right before the law is what it really means. Or being declared righteous before the law. That's what justification is. No one who takes the law seriously will ever speak evil of the law, which is a transcript of God's character. The law says thou shalt not steal. God would never steal from you. The Bible, the law says, thou shalt not bear false witness. God would never tell you a lie. He is the God of truth and righteousness and goodness. Now this passage in Isaiah 33, verse 22. Isaiah 33, verse 22. Isaiah is one of those wonderful books that we have in the Bible. I hope you're taking advantage of reading Isaiah. Isaiah 33, verse 22. For the Lord is our what? Judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. In other words, he's our savior. Same, same one. He's the God of the Old Testament. This passage says that the one who is the lawgiver is also our savior, our king, and it's the savior who forgives us as he intercedes for us in the sanctuary in heaven. You know, the book of Hebrews is so special because it is the one letter, the letter to the Hebrews, that tells us what Jesus is doing right now. Let's look at a couple of texts from Hebrews again. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Talk about intercessory prayer. Somebody mentioned that this morning. <clears throat> Jesus intercedes for us. Uh, Hebrews 7, 22 and 25. Hebrews 7, 22 and 25. It says, uh, <clears throat> By so much was Jesus made a, what is the word? Surety. Surety. Okay. That's a powerful word. Surety of a better testament. And verse 25, 
Wherefore is able to save them to the uttermost that come to him, come by him, seeing he ever does what? Lives to make intercession for us. Intercession, intercession. You know, in, the, in John, the 17th chapter, Jesus is praying for us. Did you know that? He prayed for us. Do you think he prays for us? I think he prays for us every day. He did in that prayer. Read that prayer through sometime. <laughs> he's, uh, he's, he's pouring out his heart in prayer to the Father for us. Matthew 17, or John 17 is an intercessory prayer from the start to the finish. Hebrews 9, verse 12. To the right, just a little bit. Hebrews 9, 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal salvation for us. He ministers with his own blood. Are you under the blood this morning? Let's look at another one. James comes right after Hebrews. James chapter 4, verses 10 to 12. James 4, 10 to 12. It says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaks evil of his brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you, ju but if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. Therefore is one lawgiver. Who is that? We just read that in Isaiah, didn't we? The Bible is wonderfully... Um, you know, uh, coordinate with each other. With the, the Bible is coordinated. There is one lawgiver who is able to save. Lawgiver who is able to save. We read that in Isaiah. And to destroy. Who are you that judge one another? A little review. The first angel who proclaims, worship him who made heaven and earth and sea. First angel, right? That's a message that goes to the whole world before Jesus comes. How else would people be ready unless there was a message, a specific message for the end time? He proclaims, worship him who made heaven and earth and sea. That's the Sabbath. The sign and seal of the law here that makes the rest of the law a valid document. If it weren't for the fourth commandment right in the heart of the law, that law could be anybody's law. Right? I mean, many, many governments in the world, governments in the world have laws similar to this. They say we shouldn't be stealing from one another and uh, killing one another and all those kind of things. So uh, that validates the document. The Sabbath is holy because God made it holy and signed it with his name for all time. And nobody, I mean nobody, has the right to change it, right? The Bible says that the law is holy and just and good. Who would want to change something like that? In Psalm 89, 34, that's the great covenant chapter in the Bible. By the way, if you haven't read Psalm 89 recently, take some time this afternoon, read Psalm 89. It says, my covenant. Now in Deuteronomy 4, it says the covenant is his law. He says, my covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. But Satan scoffs at the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, the lawgiver and the Savior. The God of the Old Testament, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 4. And God wants to place his seal in the hearts and minds of his people. Father's name written in the forehead. He is great and he is good. He has a name that is above all names. And that holiness is shared with the redeemed ones. It's in their minds. The law, you know, is God's idea. You know, I don't think it's even proper to say that God made the law. The law is a transcript of what God eternally is. He's always been that way. He didn't get that way later. He has always been a God of love. And the Bible says that love is the fulfilling of the law, Romans 13. It was God's idea. But when we give ourselves to him and he writes his law in our mind, then whose idea is it? <laughs> it becomes our idea. He shares that with us. 
It's the miracle of the new birth. <clears throat> it's not some fuzzy feeling in the stomach, but a change takes place, right? As he writes this law in our hearts. It's the miracle of the new birth. Not only our Savior, but Lord of our lives. Isaiah 8, verse 16 says that he wants to seal the law among his disciples. Seal the law among his disciples. This is what it, mean, what it means to be a new covenant Christian. The very highest form of worship that we can give to God is to be obedient children. The desolator is right there to steal and kill and destroy. He wants to prevent the sealing of true believers. In its place, he wants to instill in our minds the mark or the seal of his authority. He claims to have the right to change the law. Actually, he wanted to be God. You can read about that in Isaiah 14. He wanted to be God himself. The mark or seal of his authority, a counterfeit Sabbath. In Daniel 7, 25, it says he would think to change what? Times and laws. Whose times and laws? In that verse, it says he speaks great words against the most high. And in that same sentence, he says, and he thinks to change times and laws. Whose laws is he trying to change? The Most High's laws. That's called the mark of the beast. It's his attempt to erase from the minds of the people of God the consciousness of Jesus as our creator. You remove that idea, and you know we could come from anywhere. We could from the ooze and the mud. <laughs> okay. Millions, even billions of years ago with a lightning strike and getting all, it's, it's about as important, about as, <laughs> it's about as, uh, as foolish as to think that Henry Ford <laughs> had all these parts and then he just spoke the word and all these parts came together, right? And he had a, a working movable vehicle. That isn't even as fantastic as what's being taught today. God is the creator. Next, the second angel announces the fall of Babylon. That's the second angel's message. Brought about because she makes the people of our planet drink of wine, false doctrines, desolation indeed. And the third angel warns against, actually the third angel is the most severe warnings ever given in all the scripture. It says don't receive the mark of the beast. Don't do that. Don't go there. It's the mark of her authority to change the Sabbath. This is huge. <clears throat> the middle section of God's love letter to his church, the book of Revelation, is all about this. Uh, you can start reading about it in, in chapter 12 and right on down through the end of chapter 15 and then on through the plagues in chapter 16. This is the masterpiece of Satan because most of the earth's billions will go for it. It, it will have a desolating effect much the same as Rome's army circling the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD and destroying it and flattening it. The desolation is described in Jeremiah 4. Let's turn to Jeremiah, the fourth chapter. Talk about desolation. This has never happened yet. As we read through this passage, you notice that this has never happened yet. Jeremiah chapter 4. And let's start reading uh, verse 20. Jeremiah chapter 4, starting with verse 20. Talk about desolation. This is how the earth is going to look for a thousand years. Verse 20 says... Actually, let's start with uh, verse 22. Actually, I want to start, I do want to start with verse 20. Destruction upon destruction is cried, for the whole land is spoiled. Suddenly are my tents spoiled and my curtains in a moment. How long shall I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? For my people are foolish, they have not known. They are sottish children. They, 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 and they have none understanding. 
They are wise to do what? <laughs> That's quite an expression, isn't it? Wise to do evil. They know all about evil, and they're wise to do it. But to do good, they have no knowledge. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. It was an abyss. That's a word that describes what the earth looked like before the, before the creation started, right? As the creation started, the earth was without form and void. He spoke, and here's the earth, and without form and void. Nothing lived, no plants, no animals, no cities, no people. And the heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heaven were fled, indicating there had been birds there at one time, and there were no people now. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was the wilderness, and all the cities thereon, how many of the cities? All the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord in his fierce anger. For thus saith the Lord, the whole land shall be desolate, yet I will not make a full end. No, it will not be a full end. He's going to make a new heaven, a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. But here's a picture of, the, of what happens when the desolator has done his work. I lost my place in my notes, but I think it's Jeremiah, the 25th chapter. Verse 33 follows up on this. It says, And the slaying of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth to the other, even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. Talk about desolation. When the devil has completed his work, this is what it will be like. Called the abomination that makes desolate. Spoken of by Jesus and Daniel and John. But not a full end. Because at the end of the thousand years, in Revelation chapter 21, Revelation 20 talks about the thousand years. Revelation 21 starts right out and says, a new heaven, a new earth. That's the good news. Cities all broken down. No people, no birds, only darkness and the earth without form and void. A desolator comes in. He wants to replace that place, that holy place of God's name with a counterfeit. Not a savior, but he's a destroyer. In fact, in one place it's been translated um, the, the, um, the uh, abominable sacrilege. That's the, abomin that's the height of abomination. He comes in and wants to stand in the holiest place in the universe, the place of God's name. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 says he stands in God's temple saying that he is God. That's happened and is continuing to happen as we speak. There is no more holy place than the memorial of Christ's creative power and his saving grace. His, he is the lawgiver and the savior. Why do you think the law is so important to us other than pointing us to Jesus? Deuteronomy chapter 6 says it is for our good always. The law is for our good. It keeps us out of jail. It keeps us out of trouble, right? Satan is doing all this. Oh, how Satan hates the fourth commandment because he hates the creator God, Jesus Christ. And when the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached to all the world, everyone gets a choice. Through the name of Christ, it appears that the multitudes will believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That multitudes will believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, it says there will be a multitude which no man could number. Standing before the throne. What an idea. Paul 
talks about the 144,000, a multiple of 12, will be a great teaching body who will go out to the world in latter rain power and the earth will be, com will be completed and, rape and reaped in a very short period of time. The Old Testament prophet says the plowmen will catch up with the reaper. If you can contemplate that, that's how quick the work of the Lord will make finally at the end. And then the end comes. Satan has made his last stand. He tries to deceive and kill and destroy all of God's saints. And the question is, will he be successful? <laughs> the Bible says, here is the patience of the saints. That's literally translated, here is the steadfast endurance of the holy ones. Here is the patience of the saints. Here they keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. It's almost like God is answering the devil here. He's saying, where are the people? Where are they? And the Lord says, here they are. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. These are the ones who worship me. They vindicate God's grace and his authority. My friends, I say this with no joy in my heart. But Sunday is coming. In Revelation, it's called the formation of the image of the beast. Caused by the beast with the lamb-like horns. It will be accompanied by horrific deceptions and lying wonders and false, and false uh, revivals all over the place. You can read about that in Revelation 13, 13 to 15. This is Satan's last stand before the close of human probation. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the day of preparation. Satan can live with the idea of some parts of the law of God. He can live with the idea, thou shalt not steal. But he's the greatest thief in the universe. He can live with the idea, thou shalt not bear false witness, but he's the greatest liar in the universe. He can live with the idea that thou shalt not kill, but Jesus said he was a murderer from the beginning. He can live with those commandments. Not very well, but when it comes to Sabbath, he goes crazy in the end time. Crazy is the word that describes the deceptive power to destroy multitudes of people who would dare to take his place in heaven. Crazy because he would take God's place. This is the abomination that makes desolate in Matthew 24, 15. But in chapter 24, Jesus also gives warning about Satan's plans to accomplish all of this. And I'd like to have you turn with me to Matthew, the 24th chapter. Matthew chapter 24. This is Jesus explaining to the disciples what it would be like before Jesus comes. Matthew chapter 24. This is an answer to a specific question the disciples ask him. What will be the sign of your coming in the end of the world? And you remember we read the text earlier in the chapter. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then what? Then will the end come. I think that's good news. Don't you think so? Matthew 24, 23 to 27. It says, Then if any man shall say to you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if, if they shall say to you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth to the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. It's not going to be something secret. I don't know. The other night, <laughs> this night, a couple of weeks ago, there was a lightning storm in this valley. Anybody see that? <laughs> I think it came right over our house. I thought the bombs were dropping. <laughs> it woke me up.
When Satan impersonates Christ, it will be an overwhelming delusion. It will come by way of a false revival. People will be talking with what they call a prophetic voice and then be accompanied with miracles and supernatural things. And uh, when it's over with, a whole lot of people have been deceived and lose their way. I think it will even bring Seventh-day Adventists to the test. Some things are sacred. Some things are sacred. Satan will not be able to duplicate the second coming. Jesus said, ye men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up to the same Jesus which is taken up from you will so come in like manner as you have seen him what? Go. So he's going to come from heaven, right? When he comes. Second th- th- and First Thessalonians 4, 16. What does it say there? The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And we which are alive and remain, along with those who have been resurrected, will go up and meet the Lord in the air. I have to tell you, the devil will not be able to duplicate that. There's no way. Some things are sacred. Yeah, he might be out here in the desert someplace, and you might see it on television, and I have an idea that everybody will see that and have to make up their mind. And there'll be a lot of good things with that. You know, back in the, in the 1800s, late 1800s, when the Sunday laws were strong, this has happened before. That's why I believe it'll happen again, it can happen again. The Sunday laws were combined with temperance laws. <laughs> something good, anybody believe in that? <laughs> There's going to be something good involved with all of this, and it's going to look, yes, like a tremendous deception. Yes, he comes in the desert. The real Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. It won't be secret. And when Jesus comes, the dead will come out of their dusty beds together with the living, and they will ascend to where Jesus is, caught up with him in the clouds, and meet the Lord in the air. Where do they go? I think one of the most beautiful promises in all the Bible, it tells where they go. John 14, 1 to 3. Let's read it. Some of you can quote it by heart, but let's reminisce a little bit here about what the Bible says. Revelation 14, 1 to 3. The disciples were troubled because Jesus had told them he's going to go away. Notice what he says to them. Let not your heart be troubled, for ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place, how many believe that he went away to prepare a place for us? If I go and prepare a place for you, I will what? Come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be what? Also. That's where they go. They go to the Father's house, the palace of the great king, the heavenly sanctuary, the most holy place is where the throne room is. It's easy to do something in secret like in the desert and deceive many with fire from heaven, but Satan, Satan can do that. But when Jesus comes with power and glory, that cannot be duplicated. So what do you do if on the evening news, it's a news alert, right? Jesus has come. What do you do about that? Prepare for that is the burden of Christ's message in Matthew 24 and John's message in Revelation 14 and Paul's message in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. If you want to know how to be ready for Jesus to come, read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Chapter 4 tells us about the second coming and chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 tells us how to be ready for Jesus to come. The deception and desolation will bring a great time of trouble. We're in Matthew 24. We were there. Let's go back. Matthew chapter 24. A great time of trouble. Matthew 24, 21 and 22. Do I read these things to make us frightened? No. Read Psalm 91. You won't be frightened anymore. Our God is strong and powerful. And uh, he will take care of everyone. Matthew 24, 21, and 22. 
Matthew 24, 21, and 22. For there shall be great tribulation. What does that mean? Great time of trouble. Daniel describes it as a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Can you imagine something like that? They were horrific things. I watched some of the World War II movies of the, of the war in the Pacific during World War II. It was, looked horrific to me. That, that's, that's got nothing compared to what's going to come. And your bread and water will be sure. I think uh, Brian mentioned that last night. Your bread and water will be sure. Do you think God cares for the sparrows? Yes. He said he did. There shall be a great tribulation, verse 21, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh saved. But for the elect's save, sake, those days will be shortened. What a promise. Daniel spoke of that time in Daniel 12.1. At that time, says Daniel, thy people will be delivered. Everyone whose name is found where? Written in the book, God's book. This is a judgment hour idea, by the way. They will not be spirited away in some kind of a secret rapture before, before the tribulation. But they will abide in this earth through the time of trouble, much the way the, same, the three Hebrews did, and, uh, and, and they were protected from the fire. A fire that destroyed the ones who threw the Hebrews into the fire first, they were destroyed. They, could, that's a, they couldn't get close enough to throw them in without being destroyed. But God was there with them. Now Matthew 24, 29 to 31. 29 to 31. And we're winding down here. 29 to 31, Matthew 24. Immediately after the, after the tribulation of those days. Immediately after. Immediately after the time of trouble such as, such as never was since there was a nation. Immediately after that. The sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming with clouds of heaven in power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Where are we in relation to the ship to all this? Jesus gave us a little parable and is found in verses 32 to 35. Let's follow along. Jesus gave a little, we, we can, we can kind of know where we are. He said, when the fig tree puts on leaves, you know what? Summer is nigh. Verse 32, now learn a parable of the fig tree. When its branch is yet tender and has put forth leaves, you know that summer is near. God does not leave us informational-less. Informationless. is that a word? God doesn't leave us that way. Surely the Lord God will do nothing but what? Who can finish it? He reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. Now learn the parable of the fig tree. Verse 33. So likewise, when you shall see all, how many of these things? All of these things know that it is near, even at the doors. I have to tell you, the 20 plus things that are mentioned in this prophecy, we're seeing them all right now. Every last one of them. Now, there have been times in history where there have been wars and there have been this thing and that thing, but we're watching it all right in front of our eyes right now. 34, verily I say to you, this generation shall not pass. This generation that sees it all. This generation shall not pass. Till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And then verses 44 to 46. It says, therefore, be ye also ready. Those of us who have been learning these things and, and we have been believing these things, we, we need to not get ready. We need to be ready, Right? If your heart is right with God today, you would be ready if he should come today. It's time to get right with God. Give yourself to God in the morning. Make that your very first work. It says, uh, 
Verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord has made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, whom his Lord when he comes shall find what? Doing. Doing. Lawgiver and Savior, right? In that same discourse, Jesus goes into the parable of the ten virgins. It's chapter 25. It's a judgment scene. Five foolish virgins are not able to go in. They've been judged, right? Over half the parables of Jesus have to do with the judgment. And, uh, you know, many will not be able to go in. The door will be shut. And so we're living in solemn times. We're seeing all these things, and when the desolator acts by enforcing a false Sabbath, we'll know that we are there. What about you and I? We're talking, are we taking the advantage of the time that we've been given? Let's not be looking for some mystical experience. But seeking purity of heart. We are accepting by faith each day the imputed gift, are we? Are we receiving each day the the imputed gift? That's justification, right? And while we're under that rainbow, of justification, God is preparing a people to be more and more like him every day so that when he comes in the clouds, they'll be ready. Are we taking the time in secret, studying the word, and developing a meaningful prayer life? There's a prayer, a prayer warrior here I know of in, the, in our congregation. I'm not going to point her out, but she does that. She inspires others to pray. I want to challenge all of us to higher ground. Let us be sure about about Jesus, the great lawgiver and the gracious Savior. Let's be sure about that. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we want that kind of experience, Lord, to know you. And so I pray that you'll be with our people here. As we've heard these things, Lord, again and again, We know you're coming soon. And so I pray today, Lord, that we may not put it off.